Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. And welcome back to a, another episode in the Sword and Sorcery Saga series. I really should have picked a name for this series with fewer S's in it. <laughs> but uh, anyways, we are going way back in time now to a work of proto-sword and sorcery. And that is Abraham Merritt's The Ship of Ishtar originally published in 1924. So as longtime viewers of the Dungeon Dive know, Abraham Merritt is one of my favorite authors. Uh, maybe top five authors of all time. He is probably my favorite pulp author. I absolutely love almost everything I've read from him. Now this is the first time that I have read The Ship of Ishtar. And that is kind of weird because this is often cited as his best, or at least his most popular. Many, many copies of this book were sold. We'll get a little bit more into Merritt as the series goes on, and I will probably do an episode on him because I'm planning on reading a, a biography on Merritt. But he was an insanely popular author when he was living. A lot of these pulp authors were not very popular in with like big mass market sales while they were living but merit was and this book was a very good selling book so this is the first time i've read it and to be honest with you it is not among my favorites that i've read from merit um it is probably actually the least favorite thing that i have read from him there are still some good pieces to it there are some good aspects but overall i think it has a really hard time maintaining momentum there are a lot of like little stops it, it, it gets going for a little bit and then it stops it starts it gets going for a little bit and then it stops there's like these little vignettes little kinds of things that happen but it's not a very good novel in the sense that it doesn't feel like it progresses very um, just feel like, it, yeah, it doesn't build momentum in a way that I would expect, even from a collection of interconnected stories like an Elric novel would. Uh, those kind of feel like they have a, a linear momentum that is building throughout each collection. And this book just kind of, it never really gets going in a way that I want it to. I also have a little bit of problem with the main character. But now let's let's take a look at this book. So um, this is the Avon edition. So let's see what this particular Avon edition has to say. Uh, the Ship of Ishtar. The American adventurer was pitched out of his own time and into a weird world of incredible and enticing marvels. So this is kind of almost kind of a work of Sword and Planet. You have a man uh, named Kenton. He's like an explorer, an archeologist from our world and he discovers this block of stone and he chisels away this block of stone and encased in this stone is a model of this ship and on the ship are these little miniatures and almost like it's like he's looking at a toy he's discovered this ancient toy he calls the little miniatures mannequins and uh, he notices that at certain times, like the mannequins will actually change position, like it's moving somehow. And without him knowing why or how or how to trigger it, he finds himself teleported onto the deck of this ship in this very kind of typical sword and sorcery uh, world. The reason why I don't think it's exactly Sword and Planet is because he's not teleported really to another world. He's not teleported to Mars or to Venus. There isn't really any kind of space or science fiction aspect to this book. He is very much teleported into a world of sword and sorcery. And without him able to, he's not able to control this teleportation. So in the most usually in opportune moments or sometimes uh, he's whisked away while he's being captured there there are times throughout the book where he is teleported to the ship and then also teleported back to our world his world on earth and he can't quite figure out why this is happening but the more time he spends on his ship 
the more time his modernity, his uh, modern man, his sensibilities, his modern sensibilities, his education, the more of that kind of thing is kind of stripped away and he becomes more brute-like, almost more barbarian-like. And in that sense, I kind of like the way the character progresses because he is actually, he's kind of a louse. Uh, he's kind of a jerk. And he's very much into taking things that he wants without, you know, and sometimes those things are women. And even when a woman offers, offers herself to him, he's like, no, you will not offer. I will take. And the more and more t time he spends on this ship, the more brutish he becomes. And that is somewhat interesting, but I still don't really feel like there is much character progression. He's just not a very interesting character. Um, you know, Conan can be kind of brutish, but Conan is interesting because he's very good at a lot of things and he makes interesting decisions. Um, you know, Elric is not brutish, but Elric is an interesting man. He's an interesting person who makes interesting decisions and has interesting powers. Kenton, the main character here, never really comes across as somebody who is interesting. I'm not interested in spending time at all with this character. And for a work of sword and sorcery at over 200 pages, it is on the longer side. But this says, a ship of love, a ship of doom. The goddess of love and beauty was adrift on an enchanted ocean in a magic world. The myriad forces of satanic evil plagued the vessel of the rare-haired passionate goddess. Only one man, John Kenton, the American adventurer, could save Ishtar's priestess from the black magic which divided her world from ours. So by far the most interesting thing about the book is the ship of Ishtar itself. And as you can tell from this cover, the front of the ship is the light side, and this is where the goddess of love dwells. And the back of the ship is the dark side, and the ship is divided at the mast. And there's a magical force field that if you pledge yourself to the goddess of love, you cannot pass it and go to the satanic evil side and vice versa. And so there's this really interesting kind of dichotomy on this ship where there are two warring factions on this ship that both want to kill each other, but they've both pledged loyalty to their respective sides, and so they can't get at each other. Well, when Kenton teleports to the ship, he has not devoted his life to either side yet. So he can pass through this barrier and he can do the whims of either side against each other. Unfortunately, while that is interesting, that dramatic tension, that plot device, that problem is solved at about a quarter of the way through the book. And so you very quickly lose that most interesting aspect of the book. I also feel like this is Abraham Merritt being a pulp author, of uh, an author of adventure stories, he is very much writing in the vein of purple prose. And I think that the Ship of Ishtar is especially purple. There are dozens, sometimes dozens of exclamation points on a single page. Sometimes it is very poetically written, like Merritt is, uh, like, like he's known for. He is a fantastic prose stylist. But I had some pretty difficult times um, while I was reading this, keeping track of what was going on, even though the plot is relatively simple. Now, one character I did really like is Sigurd. Sigurd is this um, Viking that is a slave on the ship that Kenton rescues and they become partners. And Sigurd is a very cool character. I like him a lot. I like his backstory. And he is the one who I wanted to root for. I would have much rather had him be the main character rather than Kenton. I find him more interesting. But as the story goes, Kenton takes control of the ship. He falls in love with the priestess of Ishtar. The priestess gets captured. Uh, he has to rescue the, the, the priestess. He fights these like necromancers and evil sorcerers and that kind of thing. Goes to different islands. But there really isn't a strong overarching narrative that 
gels everything together and so it kind of feels a little meandering as things never really build momentum and that is really the main problem with this i i, I don't recommend this as somebody's first merit i would say that um the uh, the people of the pit the short story his short story collection which my my mind is blinking right now i can't remember what that is called i will put it in the comments or is a better beginning or the metal monster or the face in the abyss and i think the moon pool are all better than the ship of ishtar so unfortunately i can't like i'm not coming out as a strong recommendation but if you like merit if you like old pulp adventure novels and you've read quite a few and maybe you're looking for a a deeper cut this might be something that interests you i also have a couple other editions of that book so here's one with the same cover just slightly different design these two are also both avon editions uh, this is the oldest i think this one is the next and then this one i believe that was the publication order and then i also have this really nice edition the memorial edition with illustrations by Virgil Finley and Virgil Finley is among the best fantasy artists and this is just a really nice edition that I enjoy a lot I wish I liked the I wish I liked the story better <laughs> I wish they had these memorial editions of all of Merritt's work especially if they were to include art by Virgil Finley I need to get a couple of Virgil Finley's art books so I can share those on the channel because uh, his art is just amazing. It's, it's so well detailed, so many great lines. It almost kind of looks like Dory's old wood carvings. But uh, this is a yeah, really nice edition of this book. I just wish I liked the story a little bit more. But yeah, so that was uh, Ship of Ishtar. It's pretty well written. It can be a little difficult to follow at times because of the purple prose and the way that Merritt uh, is very ornate in his writing. It does contain some pretty cool ideas, especially with the ship itself and some things surrounding the adventure. But unfortunately, it never really builds the momentum that I am looking for in this kind of work of exciting fantasy. So, all right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed that look of A. Merits, the ship of Ishtar, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.